Hong Kong, one of the most densely populated cities in the world. To be precise, it has 22,000 people packed into every square kilometer of developed space. It's estimated that the average person in Hong Kong has about 130 square feet of living space. It's not a lot, about the equivalent of four queen-size beds. But even that is a luxury for the tens of thousands living in the city's infamous cubicle homes. These are homes created by enterprising landlords who divided up their apartments into tiny units and rented them out for easy money. For the approximately 100,000 residents who live here, their homes are illegal. But for years, the government turned a blind eye because there aren't enough public flats to house them. Get Real enters Hong Kong's world of cubicle dwellers to find out if living in a cubicle is their only option. Every afternoon, 62-year-old Chung Chiu Yen picks his daughter up from school. It's only a 10-minute walk. But in that short distance, they are reminded of where they stand in Hong Kong's property ladder. Because this is where the Chungs live. It's known as a partitioned home. Their landlord had divided the original apartment into four units and rented them out. The Chungs have the largest unit. But at 150 square feet, or the equivalent of only four queen-size beds, it's still a squeeze. Partitioned homes like this are common in Hong Kong, where only 7% of the island's 1,000 square kilometers is developed for residential use. It is the city's way of packing seven million people into its small space. Big enough for Mr. Chung, perhaps, but not so for his daughter, Elaine. Mr. Chung is a single parent and unemployed. He wants to move to a public rental flat, but he's stuck. He's not eligible for public housing because he has an ancestral property registered in his name. But he says he can't live there because it's an hour and a half away by bus, too far from the schools. Mr. Chong is what social workers call an N-nothing. People in need who have no access to public housing and who do not qualify for any welfare assistance.
It takes about one, two, three, four, five steps to cross the entire length of Mr. Chang's 150 square foot apartment. And for this, he's paying 2,100 Hong Kong dollars or about 270 US dollars a month. Now that's actually considered cheap. Mr. Chang says an identical unit down the corridor costs twice as much in rent. But if you're looking for some of the priciest homes in Hong Kong, 54-year-old Yong Xuan knows where to go. He lives there. Yung Sven rents a windowless cubicle of just 35 square feet, slightly bigger than his bed. It's so small, there's no room to stretch out, much less to cook. There's nowhere he can go but sit here on his bed. As for his things, well, they get stuffed into corners and under the bed. It's hardly the lap of luxury. Yet it costs Mr. Jung 180 US dollars a month in rent. To add insult to injury, that's five dollars per square foot, twice the rate of some private condominiums. Worse still, the landlord slaps on a hefty premium for electricity. This entire unit is about 700 square feet which is even smaller than a typical three-room flat in Singapore. Now, the landlord has obviously tried to squeeze out as much rentable space as he can. There are 13 tiny rooms here, including one just above my head. I'm told that an old man lives up here, and the space is so small that he can hardly stand up. Mr. Young is resigned to the lack of space. He's also used to sharing just one toilet and one sink with his 12 other neighbours. What bothers him most are the bedbugs and the insufferable heat. With only one window shared between 13 residents, heat stroke is a constant danger. In the past year alone, Mr. Jung was hospitalised four times. <laughs> Both Mr. Yong and Mr. Chung live in the poorest districts in Hong Kong. Sham Shui Po and Tai Kok Sui. Here is also where you'll find the most cubicle homes. These homes serve as cheap refuge to mainland Chinese immigrants, the old folk, the ex-convicts, and the city's poor. Most of them earn less than half of the median household income of 2,700 US dollars. And many are waiting to escape to a public rental flat. But with supply lagging far behind demand, the wait is often longer than the government's target of three years. There is currently no law against partitioning one's home for rent, like what Mr. Jung's landlord has done. It's only a problem if the rooms pose a fire hazard, but it's unlikely that Mr. Jung's home will pass the test. 上一年,我们在花园街有一个大火烧死了几个人以后,很多人在讨论,他们是不是有问题,安全问题,结构问题,然后政府才做一些行动。After the break, just how serious are the authorities in solving the housing problem? 我们要问的一个问题就是,他们搬走了以后会到哪里去? In Hong Kong, where space is at a premium, Madame Chen's rooftop house would be the envy of many. 
After all, there are two bedrooms, a living room, and outside, a view of the night sky. Well, she doesn't agree. Besides bad weather, there's the constant threat of eviction. Madam Chen and the 13 other families who share the same roof live here illegally. But she didn't know it until recently, after a warning letter was served. Rooftop as well as partition rooms are supposed to be illegal. But at the same time, these people have to use water, electricity, telephone, and gas, and even postal services. And uh, even though the government is providing them with water and allow them to use public utility, it does not really mean we are uh, accepting, accepting them as legal. In January, the new chief executive, Leung Chunying, vowed to increase the public housing supply. The plan, to build 20,000 new units a year, up from the current 15,000 a year. But critics say even at that rate, it'll take at least a decade to clear the current waiting list of 210,000 housing applicants. Others, like legislator Frederick Fong, take aim at the fact that Mr. Leung's plan kicks in only in 2018, after his five-year term expires. The chief executive is not elected by the people. He only accounted to a, a, a thousand and two hundred people as his voter. Since they are not elected by us, not elected by the people, they won't care, care about the people's issue and people's problem. You're a legislator. Yeah. You know, what do you think you can do? Actually, I, I, in Hong Kong, a, a legislator can't do much because we have no uh, authority or power to make policies. We can give suggestions to the government how to improve the, the issue and how to solve the problem. Upset it or not, it's up to the government and up to the chief executive. And there's the question of political will. Hong Kong is a uh, capitalist society and our economy has been very much reliant on property development. So if the government is providing a large volume of public rental housing, who will really bother to buy the private flats? So I would say that um, the Hong Kong government has also some sort of best interest in terms of uh, sustaining a private uh, property market, especially the government is selling land to the private developers so the government can get revenue. On the ground, patience is wearing thin. In the past few months, Hong Kong residents have taken to the streets to show their anger. This evening, a group has gathered at the office of the Society for Community Organization, or SOCO, to plan another protest. SOCO is a non-governmental organization that works on behalf of Hong Kong's poorest. This time, it's demanding more financial help for the poor. Madam Chen had participated in SOCO's earlier protest against substandard housing. It's been worth the fight. Just two days earlier, Madam Chen finally received her public flat after an 11-year wait. 
起碼你有個一個安樂窩，唔使成日誒諗住人哋逼遷啦，住下又咁又話加租啦。咁我而家嗰度起碼係穩定啊嘛。But for every successful case like Madame Chen, there are still many more waiting in the queue. And in the last six years, their numbers have more than doubled, to 210,000. But there is a puzzling trend. Despite clear signs that more people are in need of housing, government statistics reported fewer people living in partitioned homes. In fact, numbers had dropped by a third to 66,000. If they weren't sleeping on the streets, where had they gone? These are advertisements showing partitioned homes for rent. 630 US dollars for a one bedroom unit. 490 US dollars for a 150 square foot space. From these, it's hard to tell that most of these places are actually illegal. According to a study by the Society for Community Organization, tenants of partitioned flats pay around anything between 3 to 11 US dollars per square foot. The irony is that many of these technically illegal homes are more expensive per square foot than some of Hong Kong's luxury apartments. In the last few years, rents for partitioned homes have gone up fast. It's now at least 22% more on average compared to 2008. Faced with escalating rents, some people started looking for cheaper alternatives. Their search took them here. This looks like a regular industrial estate. Until nightfall. It's 9 p.m. Get Real has returned with social worker Angela Louis. She's from the Society for Community Organization and focuses on housing issues. We're here to meet Yu Wai Chan, a construction laborer. And this is his home. A factory floor divided into 30 windowless cubicles, each barely bigger than a single bed. Mr. Yu can only keep the bare essentials. A television, and a fan to provide some fresh air. The rest of his things are in Shenzhen, on the mainland, where his wife and daughter live. The landlord has laid down some ground rules for living here and one of it is that you cannot light a flame to cook. The reason is quite obvious. There's just wood everywhere. The toilets and bathrooms are shared among the 30 residents. Sanitation is rudimentary at best. Mr. Yu and his neighbors constantly worry about being evicted, but it's a trade off they're willing to make for the rent. They pay about 170 US dollars a month for a 30 square foot cubicle. The clincher is that they do not have to pay a hefty deposit for rent and utilities. If that's a good deal, 
it's an even better one for the landlord. When for a factory, um, for a large area, it only costs um, 7,000, 8,000, even 10,000 at most. And when they can use that area to separate it to um, 12 or even 15 cubicles, and each one can cost 1,300, then you, for a simple calculation, you know that it earned a lot. Mr. Yu is typical of a growing number of Hong Kongers who can't afford even a partitioned home in the market. And they're getting younger and better educated. Short of sleeping on the streets, this is their only option. Because in Hong Kong, the situation is like you will have a higher education level, but it doesn't mean that you can get a good job. And after you can go, get a quite good job, then it doesn't mean that you have a, quite a good salary that you can afford your uh, living. In a city where average home prices have jumped 76% since 2008, social workers say the government should do more to help. Bring back rent controls and give additional subsidies to those living in subdivided homes. But these are just temporary measures. The real solution, they say, is to increase the stock of public housing. Yong Shun applied for a public housing flat one year ago. He's tired of living in a tiny, windowless cubicle, no bigger than his bed. But the odds are stacked against him. With 210,000 others in the queue, and only 15,000 new units a year being built. He can only wait. Till then, the park is the only place he can go to to escape the suffocating confines of his cubicle home. Yong Shun's 